Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another session of Career Talk with OG. And uh, again, we're still Hispanic in Hispanic Heritage Month. We have a few more days to go until at least corporate America, you know, says it ends. But listen, when you're Latino, we're 365 days celebrating here, Latinos, okay? And today, I didn't. I don't have just one, but I have two amazing folks. I have board president of Long Beach uh, City uh, Community College District, uh, Edlinda Chico, and superintendent president of Long Beach City College, Dr. Mike Munoz. Muy buenos dias. Thank you so much to yes. both of you for joining yes. us. Good morning. So, uh, you know, let me uh, let me start here uh, first with, um, uh, well, first of all, I don't know why this screen popped up here, but uh, what I want to do is, uh, uh, Linda, I'm going to start with you, just a quick introduction to our audience, and then um, I want to turn it over to you just to kind of fill in, or as I say, you know, to add some sazón here to your to your bio. But um, trustee Edlinda Chico probably serves Area 4, which includes East Long Beach and uh, Catalina Island. She is the product of the California Community College system and as trustee has prioritized collaboration and engagement through programs and events that open our campus to the broader community. She is the first person of color to be elected to this seat and the first Mexican American elected to the Long Beach Community College Board of Trustees. Wow, that's amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you. Uh, but let me do a quick intro and then again, we'll come back to uh, Edlinda. But Dr. Mike Munoz, again, he is the Long Beach Community College District Superintendent and President and a nationally recognized transformational leader. You're going to see why uh, that is here. But transformational leader in higher education, he is an expert in closing racial equity gaps for students of color, creating inclusive campus cultures for LGBTQIA plus students, and effectively leading for transformational change. So, uh, Elena, let me start with you. I yeah. mean, you put your bio, I, I mean, literally, we could just do this whole show on reading both yours and Dr. Munoz's bio here. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> please share, share with the audience a little bit more about your career journey. Sure. Um, and well, first, I do want to clarify one thing. I, I am the first uh, Mexican-American woman elected to the Board of Trustees. I don't want to take away uh, from uh, my 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 friend, my good friend, Roberto Oranga, who was uh, the, the first Mexican-American uh, that was elected and served as president uh, in, in some of our, our community college uh, organizations, uh, national organizations. So um, I, I, I do want to clarify that. But, uh, you know, I have a very interesting journey. I, I grew up in East LA, uh, the city of commerce, third generation there. Um, my uh, grandparents who are behind me, uh, they, um, uh, they were engaged in, in a lot of the civic activities. Um, and helped incorporate the city of commerce. They were there before incorporation. On my other side, um, you know, I had um, a very large family. My mom comes from a family of 13. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, even though both sets of my grandparents were born in the United States, they were shamed and disciplined and forced to assimilate and disconnect from their culture. And so my parents don't speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. Uh, and so that was a struggle uh, until I uh, got older and went to Mexico and found that connection that just pulsed through my blood. I really felt it. Uh, and so now you walk into my hacienda and you're <laughs> you are in Mexico. I, I really do pay homage to my heritage now and, and learn every day more and more about my ancestors. And, and I'm very proud of that. And um, well, I, I said earlier that you, you can never take away my beautiful brown skin or, or my name, Erlinda Chico. Uh, it is important that we represent and, and we're visible. My parents didn't have the opportunity um, that, that I had or Mike had to pursue their education. They were teenage parents. 
Uh, and so uh, my dad dropped out of his first semester of college uh, to uh, to get a job and pay for me and my mom. And um, they're still together today and, and uh, still keeping the family together. And uh, I think sometimes about my mom uh, not completing high school and she went on to work in uh, international exporting. And can you imagine if she had been given the opportunity to pursue an education, a higher education, what she would have done? Um, so uh, I'm very proud of both of them and, and the life that they provided. But I, I'm, um, I understand our students because I come from that, right? Community college, teenage parents, we know that struggle. And so I'm really happy to be here. And that's why it was important that I, I ran for this, this seat uh, to, to represent uh, our students. Oh, my God. Elena, you, you touched on so many things that I, I literally just like at least three topics that we can do just episodes on just some of the things that you touched in. One of the things, and thank you so much for to for talking, you know, briefly about the shaming and the and the assimilation and right that your parents uh, experience and the, and the out the repercussions of that, right? And mm -hmm. uh, because there's so many students out there, so many generations that fall into the similar situation, uh, and why you know some of us don't speak Spanish. Uh, but also I love the fact that you, it sounds like you went back and kind of rediscovered el tesoro de nuestra herencia hispana, right? So Yes, and, and you know, just because I don't speak Spanish doesn't make me any less Latina. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, Dr. Munoz, and, and by the way, uh, uh, if it's okay with you, can I just call you Mike? Mike is fine, yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Those of you in academia, please, you heard it directly from him, okay? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. So everyone, Mike and I, I actually been following Mike on LinkedIn now probably for about two years. And it was a year ago that we finally met in person. And I was kind of like stressed struck because he literally like I turn around to my left and he's like bam right there and I went up to him I'm like Mike like I've been following you on LinkedIn and I love your post his activity especially as a college president super he's super busy traveling doing so many things yet he's constantly sharing information about the students the community the work that he does and that's what drew me to you Mike and so Today, I'm glad that we're here together. And please, can you share a little bit also about your either personal or career journey? Well, thank you, OG. I appreciate being here. And, you know, um, it's really an honor to share space with Board President Chico. Um, she's an, her, her journey is also an inspiration of mine. And I feel like there's a little bit of overlap and connection. Um, you know, I'm, I'm second, third generation Mexican American myself as well. And so, some, you know, some, some of those kind of early struggles, I think, I, I really identified with. You know, I grew up, I don't speak Spanish fluently either, um, but I, I I identify as Chicano, and that's a very important part of my identity. And you know, um, going through school, you know, I, I college wasn't really presented to me as an option. And so, um, but I, I found my way to a community college. And when I was uh, raising my daughter by myself, I, I had to make a decision. You know, what kind of life do I want to give her? And it was really about creating a life of generational love, support, and wealth. And not wealth, but just in accumulating money and property. Right. Living a life of purpose and meaning was very important to me. And so I found my way out to a community college, and I was very lucky. It was the first time in my whole kind of academic experience that I came across. Uh, my counselor was a Latino male, and, it was, and he wasn't, you know, maybe he was about 10 years older than me. So he, he still, I was able to relate to him in ways that as a 19 year old or 20 year old, um, there was connection there. And he guided me through my educational journey. And, and I always say, you know, my counselor didn't wave a magic wand and remove every barrier that I was facing. But what he did is he, he I think about somebody who carries a lantern, he illuminated a path for me. Mm, and I love that. me with yeah. resources. And he taught me to help believe in myself. And so that led me to transfer to UC Irvine. I lived in family housing with my daughter. She attended the Child Development Center on campus. And then I went on and earned a master's degree in counseling and worked as a counselor. And then eventually moved into higher education administration or my doctorate at Cal State Long Beach, go beach. And, 
Um, I, I transitioned out of accounting role into an administrative role because really my heart was, um, as much as I love working individually with students, I wanted to create structural and systemic impact. I was frustrated the way undocumented students were being treated in our system. I was frustrated by you know, the anti-blackness I was seeing at our institutions. And so I felt like I needed to step into a role where I could create change to make sure that our unhoused students, our students with dependents, our formerly incarcerated students had someone that was going to represent their lived experiences and their challenges in the room where it happens, right? In the, in the space where decisions are made. And so that's essentially what led me to this path of being a college president. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Both of you um, definitely inspiring me uh, here and with your stories here. And, um, you know, the reason why I invited both of you to um, be on, uh, uh, on Career Talk with OG is because just like last year, because both of you were at the conference that we were at, and then just a month ago, we were, again, we saw each other at the same conference. And um, as an introvert, I tend to observe more people, you know, just watch. And I saw the synergy, the the the, the camaraderie, right? Almost kind of like comadre, compadre, is working together, talking, esa confianza, quite frankly. And so, so I want to start off today with, um, I believe that in order to have a, a, to develop a very strong, unified team, or in this case, you know, board with the with the the president, college president, you need to develop that confianza, that trust. And so, let me open it up to either of you, either Edlinda or Mike. If if you can talk to us of what that means confianza what does that trust look like what does it mean in terms of the the, the board and the uh the college president how do you create that what does that mean well i i can go ahead and, and start and just say that <clears throat> i think um for me it's about uh seeing somebody who isn't just talking the talk but walking the walk and um when 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 we say we're going to do something we have to do it and i saw that of mike and uh i trusted that he was going to fulfill those commitments and those goals that he had put forth um, we have shared values uh so it was easy for me to support that but um you know we also have to trust our areas of expertise and the roles that we're in i don't come from a higher ed background uh, i come from the community uh, that's where my expertise is and so i uh you know worked with with uh, dr munoz to say trust me when i tell you i know this community and this is how we can reach this community better um, I look to him for the policy, the, the ways in which we can expand some of our resources, um, mm -hmm. where we can change what we offer to fit our community. So it really is a beautiful collaboration. But I trust him implicitly because he has knowledge that I don't have. And that's the way that we're able to work together and complement one another. Wow. Woo, woo. Yeah, there's some good stuff here. There's some good, folks, I hope you're catching this. Okay? There's some good stuff here because, first of all, Elena, it takes courage for you to, as a board of La Jefa, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's just it, okay, to admit that I don't have this expertise because right. normally I come from the corporate background. Normally mm -hmm. in the corporate world, we're, we're, we're taught to fake it until you make it, you know, that right. type of stuff. But here you are, like, listen, this is not my expertise. But this is my expertise, and there's value mm -hmm. to that. So, so That's thank right. you, um, Mike. Let me also throw this question to you. What is, as a college president, what does that confianza trust mean? How do you earn? How do you develop that confianza with the board and even with your staff, with your yeah. team? It's a great question, um, and it's it's one that requires intentionality. You know, the confianza that I share with Board President Chico. Um, I think first and foremost, it starts with, I see her as my thought partner. Um, and she's someone I can call and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. What are your thoughts? 
how do you see this issue? Because, you know, I think the, you know, this kind of singularity thinking that there's only one way of looking at an issue or through one lens that doesn't serve our students, that doesn't serve our communities well. And so I think because as, as a president, the way I work with the board and then especially the board president is I see them as my thought partner. And, you know, and because, um, and I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable, okay, um, because I feel like we need to be able to talk honestly. There are some examples up and down the state where you see tension between the college president, the CEO, and the board. And it's almost like they're, sometimes there's a little almost like they're working in competition of each other. And I, I never understood when I would see examples of that. And so for me, it was never, it was always about if I'm going to work with a sport, you know, I'm their one employee. I need to understand what their values are. I need to understand what their priorities are. I need to anticipate what their needs are and how all of those things connect with our students and serving our community. And then ensure that there's an alignment between the board and myself as the leader. And thankfully, there is a strong alignment between this board and myself. You know, when I get to go out in the community, a lot of folks will tell me like, or just even out nationally or statewide at conferences, people are like, oh my God, you're doing so amazing things at Long Beach City College. It's so dynamic. And I said, you know what? I can do these things because I have the backing and support of my board. Yeah. The board has put their faith in me and has prioritized equity, has prioritized justice, has prioritized you know, student a student first mindset that allows me to lead in this way. And so that alignment is so important. And so that's why I think the confianza and to trust our board president Chico's point, many leaders fall into the trap of performative types of actions. And we are a get down, be about it college. That's great. No, our board has high level expectations of me. I have high level expectations of myself. And we're about students and we're about impact and we're about community and we're going to do this. And so that's why it's, it's the it's it's judging us by our deeds. Right. Our yeah. work. And that's I think that's what's creating. I, 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 as I listen to both of you share your your perspective here and, and trust and confianza, I can't help it but bring it back to, you know, uh, com, uh, el compadrasco, compadrasco, right? When you have compadre, if you think about it as a parent, you find a godparent, right? A padrino, madrina who ultimately you trust fully with your child, right? Esa confianza. And this is what I'm hearing. It's like from both of you, like you each trust each other. You have, you know, a shared vision, goal, objective, work, working together, not to compete, but for the betterment of the students. Mm -hmm. right? um, in terms of let's, let's now take it to the ne to the next area um, as far as working together collaboration okay what uh, mm -hmm. and Mike uh, I'll, I'll uh, this I'll start with you first so share with us some examples of of collaboration right and also if there's a new or um, uh, a, a young uh, college president or someone that is thinking of moving into your role, what advice would you give him or her to create that collaboration, you know, uh, the way you've done it? So there's so many examples. Um, one that comes to mind is our Boys and Girls Club partnership. Um, as Board President Chico mentioned, um, she was the daughter of teenage parents. I was a teenage single father. Right. So we both had these kind of lived experiences and coming out of the pandemic when we were reviewing survey data as why students were um, not enrolling back in college. Those that had left us during the pandemic, one of the um, cited reasons was child care, after school care. So started talking about what would it look like to address this issue. And one of the things that I think was really bold apart from, you know, this groundbreaking partnership with hosting a Boys and Girls Club on our campus was, you know, getting the board behind it. And, and because there's a lot of, you know, I can tell you, you know, this is uncharted space. You get into liability and insurance and joint use agreements. And this is, you know, it can be very intimidating. And so yeah. some schools will shy away from taking on a partnership like the Boys and Girls Club because of these nuances. And, um, because of the bold and visionary leadership of the board, particularly for President Chico, it was like full steam ahead. 
we're going to do this and I want this to be mine. And so, you know, what could have taken a year to implement, we implemented in six weeks. We were oh like presenting the Boys and Girls Club now on this campus. We got within six weeks, a Boys and Girls Club open on our campus from 2 to 8 p.m. every day for our students, Monday through Friday, um, ages 5 to 17. And we did that because the board saw that, you know what, we needed to prioritize this as a president and empowered me to be able to kind of cut through the red tape and the bureaucracy that oftentimes mm -hmm. slows these, these initiatives down. And, you know, now we have this thriving program and students are being served in ways that they weren't served before. Um, that's an example. That oh, like I, yeah, you're speaking my language now because um, I I come from the startup world where we're, we're very agile, move quick. I understand in academia, right? It, there's reasons why you have certain things that you do, but the fact that you were able to come in unity and in you know in six weeks, um, I mean, congratulations to all of you. And in fact, actually, Angelica, if you get a chance. Um, uh, again, everyone, Angelica is my daughter. She's the Wizard of Oz behind the scenes. All right. But if you can share some of those links, uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs and some of these other programs, that would be awesome. Um, and Linda, let me come back, uh, come to you now, okay, in terms of collaboration. So we just heard Mike talk about the importance of having the board on the same page. As the board president, I mean, you're just – you, not, I shouldn't say it like that, that you're just one. Uh, you're, you're one vote, obviously a very important vote, but, but you also need to get buy-in from the rest of the board, okay? Right. And so talk to us, how, how, how do you work that collaboration with other board members? What, what's, like, what, what, like, what's the magic behind this? <laughs> You know what? I wish it was as easy as magic, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, it is. It is work. Uh, getting five strong personalities to work together can sometimes be a challenge. The good thing is that all five of us share the same values, and so it is just treating each other with respect, uh, dignity, professionalism. Um, because they each of us have our own lived experience to bring to this role that we serve. And so giving everyone the space and the opportunity to share their experience um, is always helpful. Um, and we're not always going to agree. We don't always agree. And that's OK. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, Ray Cordova, uh, you, he, he always says, if you and I agree on everything, one of us is not necessary. And I really believe that because we don't need a bunch of yes people around us. We need different perspectives, different insight, different uh, lived experience. So we're not always going to agree and that's okay. It's having that respect, that dialogue, uh, and that understanding. Eventually, we get to a place of agreement and support because we share those values. And at the end of the day, we know that we're doing this uh, to help support the success of our students. Yes. Well, and yeah, I uh, I mean, obviously, I, my experience is different as far as working on the board. I used to run a local chamber of commerce and I had a board. Right. And and so forth. But um, but so, OK. The third area that I want to talk about here is creating a vision, creating a vision. And last week, I had the the the, the pleasure of attending a an event in San Diego, uh, where the state chancellor talked about her vision 2030, vision 2030. And we all know, obviously, the importance of creating a vision. Um, this again, either one of you. What, when you create a vision for the college, for the district, what, who, what, what, what goes into creating this vision and how do you actually make that vision into a reality? Because I oftentimes see, you know, you have retreats, great ideas, but then the execution falls flat. So 
either one of you, this to either one of you, in terms of creating that vision and then executing on that vision. I'm going to defer to Dr. Munoz because he's got to wrangle all of us cats <laughs> to get all of our, our visions together. But I, I'm going to let him uh, start yes. this one off. No, thank you, Board President Chico. Um, so, you know, that's a great question, OG. And I, I always start with visions are co-created. Visions don't belong to, you know, people, when I first became president, that was something people came up to me and was like, what's your vision? And I was a little overwhelmed and intimidated by that question because that's a, that's a heavy question. And I always say, you know what? The vision doesn't belong to one person, to a leader. It belongs to all of us. It's shared and it's co-created. And it's co-created by bringing people together, listening to people, understanding what they value. And so I think at Long Beach City College, we've been really successful in developing a clear vision. I mean, if you look at our strategic plan, we really narrowed it down to four focus areas, you know, and it's supportive. You know, it's innovation, it's synergy, you know, and so it's really thinking about how our values align with our actions. And I would say, you know, what I really appreciate about working with this board of trustees is that they are really big about accountability. And so it's not just about like, we're going to say we're going to do these things. We meet regularly and bring data and put the data in front of them. So they're monitoring our progress and our metrics that we said we were going to hold ourselves accountable to towards actualizing that vision. And so I think it's a cycle. It's really about, it starts with people and it starts with creating a common understanding amongst all constituents. So the board, myself, the administration, the faculty, the students, the staff, and then creating that shared common understanding. And then, you know, um, not being afraid. I, I always say this to folks, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Yes. You know, sometimes a lot of times people are afraid that it's not going to work or, you know, all the conditions have to be exactly right to try something different or to be innovative. And so, I, you know, like we use the example with the Boys and Girls Club, right? Like, you know, we didn't let perfect be the enemy of the good. We moved forward yes. or whether when it was we opened up our parking structures, to have safe parking on our campus during the pandemic. There was all these things that could have derailed that, but we didn't allow perfect meaning and new good. We said, this is aligned with our mission. It's aligned with our goals. We're gonna leap. And and then most importantly, assess. You know, you evaluate and you assess your, 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 your efforts and see if there's impact. And if there's not impact, well, then you tinker and you, you go back to the drawing board. But, you know, I think that's what we've been able to do. And I think because we all um, share this vision, we're seeing the impact that we're seeing at Long Beach City College. You know, I, I'm going to plug us. You know, this fall, we surpassed um, our enrollments for, for fall 19. So that means, you know, we're one of the few community colleges that, you know, is back to the same enrollment levels prior to the pandemic. Beautiful. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. Because, again, I know that that's also a big part of the chancellor state chancellor's vision to get those enrollment numbers uh back up um absolutely well and and and, and mike thank you for for elaborating on on creating that vision because again it is something that we hear a lot in across industries but very few in my opinion very few organizations actually ever know how to execute on on uh, on that vision and um and in fact actually I saw a post, I think it was last week, where um, Long Beach City College was just recertified as with the seal of excelencia. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Of that. Well, congratulations. For the audience, please, either one of you, share what, what that means, what is it, and, and what's the process in order to, uh, to, to be recertified? Do you mind if I take this board, President Chico? Please. Um, so the Seal of Excelencia is a very prestigious, prestigious distinction that's provided by Excelencia in Education. And what it really is, is that you go through a comprehensive review process um, to determine whether or not you're really achieving um, more than just being an Hispanic rolling institution, but a Hispanic or Latino thriving institution. Our students succeeding and thriving. Oh, it's very yes. um, there's a lot of data collection, analysis, a lot of um, narratives that need to be produced, but it's very important because I think what it's done for us, what the Seal of Excelencia has done for us is it's given us a framework and mental models to think about how we yeah. cannot just, how we can be equity minded without being colorblind. 
And so by being able to really think about what does it mean to serve Latino students deeply, we then can take that experience and it translates to other student groups on campus as well, other communities who are underserved. And so the framework has been really prestigious for us. Um, and I think it's a it's a beacon of light for Latino students in this community to know that they're going to come here and they're, they're not going to experience some disability. That we see them and we see them in all the identities that they bring with them to our institution and we value them and we uphold them. Yeah. You know, if I can add on to that, I'd also like to commend Dr. Munoz on assembling a very powerful, <clears throat> dynamic, and uh, reflective of the community cabinet, right? The cabinet that he has put together, uh, the, uh, the people he, his team that he has surrounded himself with uh, is very reflective of the community. They are, um, they're go-getters. They want to make this happen. They are accountable to themselves. They hold themselves to high standards. Um, and it is beautiful to see the diversity uh, of uh, the leadership at, at Long Beach City College. And I really do credit that to Dr. Munoz and assembling that. It is so important uh, for our students to see, for our faculty, faculty to see. Um, we still have work to do. Uh, we're a, a almost a hundred year old institution, right? We, we still have work to do, but uh, the work is being done. And, uh, and I think that people feel it, people, people see it. And that's what's really important. Yes. Well, you're right, uh, Elena. I, people do see it. I see it. I felt it. And again, it was this inter, uh, in, in, uh, interaction between the two of you that I saw last year, this year, and I keep seeing, you know, between you and, and you know, I would imagine then as we're talking with the rest of the board and just overall the community as a whole mm -hmm. too, uh, as well. But, um, you know, as we wrap up uh, our session here is I, uh, I want to give both of you an opportunity just to, you know, share anything, you know, that you want to share in terms of either something we haven't talked about or maybe a program or something that you're proud of. It's basically, it's it's open to, to you to, to share whatever you want to. And uh, if you want, um, Mike, we can we can start with you and then uh, Elinda, but uh, mm -hmm. any final words? You know, I think my final words I would just leave is that in a time where I think the whole value notion of higher education is being really questioned by so many people, I think I want students to know and people to know that college is worth it. And that, especially in terms of what it means for the aspirations of students from the Latino community, the Latina community, the Latinx community. And so, you know, it is, it, it is probably still going to be the most likely way to increase your generational wealth and opportunity in this country. And so we need to really, I think, in a time where it's kind of being questioned under attack as a Latino community, we really need to, to elevate the intentionality around creating college-going cultures in our familias. And so to really create that strong pipe, pathway and pipeline to higher ed and remove as many barriers as possible. So I think that's where I'd leave it. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Linda. You get the last yeah. word. <laughs> I uh, I agree with with Mike. Uh, I, I I think uh, it is really important, particularly as an HSI. Um, but uh, we're in Long Beach, and we serve a very diverse uh, uh, district uh, in Lakewood, Signal Hill, and Catalina Island. And what I love the most about uh, the team here at Long Beach City College is we're not leaving anyone out that they are listening to the issues, the challenges, the barriers that are happening to our students on Catalina Island, and we're addressing them. You know, you want to talk about the digital divide? There's an ocean there. They are on an island, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, how do we address those situations uh, or those barriers? We're working very closely with our, um, our justice scholars we are actively reaching out to former students who could come back. There's just a few more credits. Hey, come back. What, how can we help you come back? 
Our team is so enthusiastic and I'm so proud of them. I don't know of any other college that is doing the active work that we are. And I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are, yeah. but I'm really proud of what we're doing at Long Beach City College. I see the difference. I hear it in the community that we have a presence, that we roll deep in community events. People are excited about Long Beach City College. That makes me so proud. Oh my God. And, 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 and Linda and Mike, I, I feel how uh, proud you are of the, of the work that is being done collectively by everyone there at Long Beach City College. I, um, as you might know, I, I provide, I work with a lot of colleges, universities across the country, even internationally, uh, providing the culturally relevant career uh, readiness programming. And so I talk to a lot of professionals in your space and I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. You have it together. Uh, you're almost making me feel like going back to school, even though I'm up, up, up in the Bay Area. Like I'm, I'm, maybe I should commute to Long Beach City College. <laughs> yeah, online courses, yeah. Yeah. lifelong learning. Come on. Exactly. No, but thank you so much. And by the way, uh, Dr. Watson, a good, another good friend of mine. He's up in the San Francisco Bay Area. As you can see in the chat, he says, thank you for a thoughtful and important conversation. He's also someone um, in academia, too, uh, as well. But um, Mike, Edelina, I was looking really uh, forward to this conversation here. Um, I love both of you. I love the work that you do. I, I love the the relationship uh you know that synergy as i mentioned earlier that that you have please please keep doing what you're doing um we need you the community needs you the country needs what you're doing thank you so much for your leadership so um thank you and everyone thank you so much again for joining us again on career talk with og have a fantastic rest of the week bye everyone <laughs>